life. Throughout the long history of DC Comics, no character is really safe. Sometimes superheroes meet their untimely ends too, and no matter who it is, it always leaves us with way too many questions. What is going on all you nerdy folk out there? My name is Jack, and welcome back to Top 10 Nerd. Today we're going to be taking a look at some of the most shocking deaths in DC Comics history in terms of brutality and overall out of left fieldness. Now if you like hearing us talk about shocking deaths in comics, then you should definitely check out part 1 and part 2 of Top 10 Most Shocking Superhero Deaths that Amanda hosted. Now with that in mind everyone, let's get into today's list. Number 10, Green Arrow. Now I'm sure we all know who Green Arrow is, so I won't dive too deep into his backstory, but I will give you a little taste just in case you're not super familiar. Now Oliver Queen aka Green Arrow is a vigilante superhero who fights crime in his home of Star City, using archery, martial arts, and technology. Not to mention by day he is also a wealthy playboy and billionaire industrialist turned outspoken socially progressive politician. Honestly just think Batman, but way less sad and with arrows. Needless to say he is a good superhero and unfortunately he met an untimely end back in 1995. Here's how that story played out. The rest planned on planting a bomb that releases a bacteria that would destroy millions of buildings in Metropolis, killing all the people inside of them. The bomb works when two people put their hands on the detonator. While the bomb is in transit on a plane, for some reason Green Arrow put his arm on the detonator knowing that if he removes his arm, the bomb would explode. Superman showed up and suggested that they would just cut off the appendage with his heat vision, but Oliver for some reason refused. In the end, the bomb went off and Green Arrow became, well, no more. Check it out for yourself in 1995's Green Arrow number 99 all the way to 101. Number 9, Rorschach's Death. In the last issue of the original Watchmen limited series entitled A Strong and Loving World, we get a truly shocking reveal. Ozymandias was actually the bad guy all along. Turns out he was responsible for the death of thousands in New York, the death of the comedian, the accusations on Dr. Manhattan, and the framing of Moloch. Sure, that's shocking to say the least, but there's actually a lot more as is what happens after that's truly shocking. Now, don't get me wrong, Ozymandias' intentions were good. He did all that he could to prevent a nuclear war between the Soviet Union and the US. But it was still an injustice for Rorschach, and he wanted to expose Ozymandias. Setting out to do so, Rorschach encounters Dr. Manhattan and tells him what's actually happening. Dr. Manhattan tried to stop Rorschach from exposing Ozymandias, but Rorschach responded by saying that Manhattan had to kill him to stop him. In a shocking turn of events, Dr. Manhattan actually did so and vaporized Rorschach and chose to believe in Ozymandias' cause instead of anything else. Now if you haven't already read this limited series, I highly recommend that you go back and check it out, starting with 1986's Watchmen, number 1. Number 8, Sue Dibney's Death. Now this sad, sad death takes place during the Identity Crisis storyline, and it's actually what sets it all in motion. Now if you're not familiar with Identity Crisis, it's basically a love story wrapped inside a murder mystery, with a concerted effort to bring a real world crime and quote unquote darkness to all of the Justice League. Now it all starts with, like I said, the death of Sue Dibney, the elongated man's wife. And from there it just spirals into a story of lines being crossed by both supervillains and heroes. Addressing heavy topics like forced mind wiping, the story made some readers pretty uncomfortable to say the least, and when all was said and done, the family members of a few heroes were dead and the reputations of others were completely tarnished in brand new ways. It's eventually realized by Dr. Midnight, Mr. Terrific, and Batman, all separately I might say, that Sue was murdered using some pretty familiar technology, however it wasn't done by someone that we would expect. Now if you don't want to hear this, I will say cover your ears, but honestly you probably already know this by now, the murderer was Jean Loring, the wife of the Adam who was committed to Arkham Asylum after she was discovered. Now there are definitely two viewings of Identity Crisis, one is a dark tragedy reflective of the real world that we all live in now, and one is a tenaciously destructive tentacle of the Watchmen squid monster, still sort of wriggling around 15 years later. But I've only seen the former, but if you do see the latter, let me know in the comments below. Now if you haven't read it and want to give it a go, check out 2004's Identity Crisis number 1 all the way to 2005's Identity Crisis number 7. Number 7, Barry Allen's death. First of all, I just want to get it out there that the Crisis on Infinite Earths event is absolutely insane, and if you're not familiar with it, you should 1000% give it all a read. Put simply, it was an attempt to reboot the entire DC universe because everything had become a bit too confusing, and uh, obviously DC's way of doing that was to just get rid of the multiverse and many of its characters, one of which being Barry Allen. Near the end of the event, Barry made the ultimate sacrifice by literally running himself to death in order to save countless lives. What he did is in order to put a stop to the Anti-Monitor's plan to destroy the world with his antimatter cannon, Barry ran so fast that he created a speed vortex that would absorb the power of the cannon, but he ended up dying in the process. For years the character remained dead, leaving the mantle to Wally West, the original Kid Flash to serve as the Scarlet Speedster in his stead. Eventually this story was retconned and it was revealed that Barry didn't actually die. But back in the day this supposed death really hit home and that's why it deserves a spot on this list today. Check it out for yourself in 1985's Crisis on Infinite Earths, number 8. Number 6, Supergirl's Death. 
Now remember how I just said Crisis on Infinite Earths was an absolutely insane storyline and killed a ton of heroes? Well, sadly among those ranks was also Supergirl, losing her life one issue before Barry loses his. Now like I said before, the storyline was all about simplifying the DC Universe and having it go back to its roots. And since there was originally only one Kryptonian on Earth, that meant Kara had to go. I'm glad to say though that the character was at least able to go out like a hero as she battled it out with the Anti-Monitor who kept hitting her with lethal doses of his energy. She kept on fighting though until a lethal blow sadly took her out. Like the true hero she is, she sacrificed her life for her cousin Superman and died in his arms. Later we see Superman leave his Fortress of Solitude with the body of Supergirl wrapped in her indestructible cape and he sets her free in space, promising to remember and miss her forever. Although this death was not as impactful as Barry's, I would argue that Supergirl's was much more shocking as it was much more immediate than Barry's. Readers actually got to spend a few moments with Barry despite actually knowing that he was going to die. Well, Kara's kind of just came straight out of left field. Check it out for yourself in 1985's Crisis on Infinite Earths, number 7. Number 5, Ted Kord's death. In the pages of Countdown to Infinite Crisis, the second Blue Beetle, Ted Kord, is left near bankruptcy after funds from his company were mysteriously stolen. His investigation into his missing fortune leads him to something much, much darker though. A conspiracy to wipe out the superhuman community orchestrated by the Justice League International's former manager, Maxwell Lord. Lord had definitely enjoyed his influence over the Justice League and the formation of Justice League International in the wake of Crisis on Infinite Earths. I mean, he was a wealthy and powerful businessman who claimed to have learned nobility and compassion from his late father, Maxwell Lord III. All of this pointed to him as a very genuine figure out to keep Earth safe, but I guess we were wrong because during the invasion saga, Lord acquires the superpower of mind control, and things only got worse from there. The build up to Infinite Crisis saw many shocking events occur in the DC Universe, including Lord's brutal murder of Ted Kord. Lord's betrayal didn't even end there as he continued to damage the League throughout the Infinite Crisis. Thankfully, Wonder Woman straight up just murders him after he mind controls Superman into assaulting his fellow leaguers, snapping his neck, which was also super shocking, so I guess this point is kind of a twofer. Check out this death in 2005's Countdown to Infinite Crisis, number one. Number four, Superman's death, Wonder Woman Dead Earth. This Wonder Woman storyline follows Wonder Woman being accidentally awakened by a group of survivors from a centuries long sleep at the Batcave. Diana discovers the Earth has been reduced to a nuclear wasteland and is infected by mutated insectoid creatures. Now what does this have to do with Superman you ask? Well, in issue 3 of this miniseries, Diana and Cheetah head to the Fortress of Solitude to see if Superman is still alive and well and can help them protect the people of Earth. Upon entering the fortress, they are greeted by robot Superman and Diana gets quite the shock to say the least when she sees Superman dead on his throne. And it only gets worse from there because it turns Turns out she was the one who killed him. Flashback all those years ago to that huge war and we see the US release a full armada of missiles against all the Amazonians. Clark knew they were going to be targeting Smallville as well so he went to go protect his family, which left Wonder Woman to defend Paradise Island alone. Now there were far too many missiles and her home wound up being destroyed. She completely lost it and started pummeling Superman, ending his life with a punch straight through his chest. Now the way that this was drawn is absolutely beautiful so check it out for yourself in 2020's Wonder Woman Dead Earth number 3. Number 3, Alex DeWitt. For so many heroes, one of their biggest fears is that their secret identity will get out and put their loved ones at risk. So generally they do anything and everything that they can in order to prevent that from happening. In Kyle Rayner's case, he learned the hard way what happens if you're not careful enough. After taking over the Green Lantern mantle from Hal Jordan and receiving his power ring, Rayner seeks out his girlfriend Alexandra, or Alex DeWitt. DeWitt wasn't sure what to make of the new power Rayner had acquired, but eventually she decided to help Rayner control and understand the potential power he had command over. Probably not the best idea because he came home one day and found out that she had been killed by the supervillain Major Force and had been stuffed into a refrigerator. Kyle, obviously upset and motivated by anger and regret, sought out Major Force. Kyle almost killed Major Force before his ring runs out of power. Major Force then takes over the fight until his green rocks that powers the power rings turns into a lantern battery and charges Rainer's ring back up. Rainer finally subdues Major Force, but when he begins to interrogate Major Force over why he was there and why he killed DeWitt, the police arrived and tried to take Rainer away. Now Rainer obviously flees and runs into Alan Scott, who tries to console him over his lost. DC writer Gail Simone, now a legend in her own right, was absolutely horrified that the company consented to kill a female character and in such a gruesome way, merely to motivate the male protagonist. That's when she coined the term women in refrigerators for any time women in comics were killed, seriously injured, sexually violated, or depowered merely to motivate male heroes. And she published a long list of such cases, so go check it out for yourself. Now check out her death for yourself in 1994's Green Lantern Volume 3, number 55. 
Number 2. Jason Todd's Death The death of Jason Todd was so surprising that it not only shocked readers, it shocked DC themselves. Now the character had had a pretty weird history as he was introduced as a new teenage Robin after Dick Grayson grew up and became Nightwing. But fans weren't really too keen on him. In 1988, DC Comics writer Denny O'Neill pitched the idea to make the readers vote via 1-900 numbers on how a story should end. And O'Neill knew that the vote couldn't be on something tiny or small, so he decided that the vote would be about the fate of Jason Todd. Knowing that Todd was relatively unpopular, it seemed like the right thing to do to help settle what needed to be done with the character. Setting up a 36 hour voting period, readers got one of two numbers to call from the back of Batman number 427. The ending of that issue showed us the Joker beating Todd with a crowbar, leaving him in a warehouse that was set to explode. Then issue number 428 came out and the final vote was 5,343 for killing Jason Todd and 5,271 against killing him, meaning that his fate was kind of sealed. Jason Todd was dead and the iconic image of Batman carrying Todd's dead body that followed was one that is still recognizable to pretty much everyone today. Now, years after the event, O'Neill revealed that there was someone who programmed their phone to call every 90 seconds for 8 hours. That person chose the same option every time for Jason Todd to die. Totaling around 320 votes from that one person alone, O'Neill Neil has gone on record saying that that one person is the entire reason that Jason Todd died. So I guess they're also the reason that we have the Red Hood. So thank you? I don't know. If you're not familiar with this storyline, aka a death in the family, check it out for yourself starting the 1988's Batman Volume 1, number 426, all the way to 429. Number 1. Death of Superman Now of course, we have to talk about this one, we can't not. In 1992, the writers of the Superman titles had had enough of the Man of Steel and decided to just straight up kill him. Okay, not really. In response to not being able to do their original story, which was to have Lois Lane and Clark Kent get married, due to all the conflicts with the then upcoming Lois and Clark The New Adventures of Superman, the writers were racking their brain trying to figure out what to do, and they ultimately landed on this storyline. The way they pulled this off was they introduced a new character, an almost unthinkable monster whose only purpose was to destroy things. Known as Doomsday, this monster monster caused some serious destruction towards Metropolis. Jump forward a little bit to 1993 and we see Superman take on this unstoppable bad guy. Obviously Superman was able to take him down because you know, he's Superman, but both Doomsday and Superman ended up succumbing to their injuries at the end of the fight. Now, while some superheroes have been resurrected multiple times, this was the very first time that Clark Kent had bit the dust, and it sent shockwaves through the entire world of DC Comics. The aftermath of the story followed how the world reacted and who showed up to take its place, the latter part featuring the introduction of several new characters who stuck around to help later form the DCU. Death of Superman is one of the most far-reaching media events in comics history, and to this day it still stands as such, and that coupled with the return of Superman changed the rules for DC, opening the door for anyone to come back to life. So check out the storyline for yourself so you can see firsthand exactly what this death meant to the DC Universe. Starting with 1992 Superman, The Man of Steel, Volume 1, Number 18. That'll be it for this video, everyone. There are still tons of pretty shocking deaths left to talk about in the DC Universe. So let us know your favorites in the comments below, and maybe you'll see them turn up on a part two of this list. Now, if you haven't already, subscribe to Top 10 Nerd to stay up to date on all things nerdy. And while you're at it, why not ring that notification bell so you know whenever we upload a video. As always, my name is Jack. Thank you all so much for watching, and make sure to stay nerdy, my friends.